Well, um, our next speaker is uh, Phil Hodgson, uh, Managing Director and CEO at Calix uh, Limited. Uh, Phil joined Calix as CEO in 2013 uh, and was appointed a director in 2014 and is a member of Calix's uh, technology committee. Phil has a technical and commercial background from a successful career with Shell, uh, where for over 14 years, he developed significant depth of experience across all key sectors in the downstream oil and gas industry. Uh, from 2007 to 2013, Phil ran his own consultancy, providing project development, commercial and M&A experience and management experience to a, a large number of sectors. Uh, please welcome Phil uh, to the conference today. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, just in terms of uh, cement and lime, let me... Uh, just uh, scroll forward in the presentation. So what a lot of people don't realise is uh, in a lump of limestone, uh, about half the weight of this little rock here is actually CO2 trapped in the rock. And this is the only chemistry I'm going to do this whole presentation, I promise. Uh, but this lump of rock, uh, limestone, uh, is calcium carbonate. And uh, when the lime and cement industries heat that up to make lime and cement, uh, they release that CO2. And in fact, that released CO2 is about two thirds of their total emissions. Uh, so not necessarily the way they burn or, or uh, use the fuel in their kilns, uh, two thirds of their emissions is coming from the rock itself. And that's why the cement and lime industries uh, are widely recognized as being hard to abate uh, because uh, even if you can electrify uh, the kiln process uh, to, uh, to, a, to a renewable energy source, for example, still they'd be emitting all of that CO2 that's coming from the rock. Now, cement and lime together is probably responsible for around 8% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, cement is one of the most widely used substances on earth. Uh, and so a solution for the cement and lime industry is gonna be essential to decarbonizing uh, as we move forward. So as I said, I promise that's the, that's the only chemistry you need to learn today to understand decarbonization of cement and lime. Uh, if we just move forward to the next slide, the um, cement production uh, is quite capital intensive. So they're very large plants. I've tried to sort of simulate it here in a, in a diagram, but uh, there's, there's a big, what's called a pre-calciner or heater tower. Uh, and at the base of that tower, uh, that's where that chemical reaction occurs that releases the CO2. Uh, then uh, after it's sort of heated up and released that CO2, it moves into this long rotary kiln. And that's probably the, what most people are familiar with with a cement plant. But that's not where a lot of CO2 is released, by the way. Uh, that's where the clinkering reaction occurs that ultimately forms your cement clinker. Uh, the key reaction is occurring at the base of that preheated tower. That's where that chemical equation is right there. Now, the typical energy required uh, to, to, take, uh, to produce a tonne of cement is about five gigajoules. And for those who aren't familiar with energy, uh, that's enough power to power five million toasters. Uh, so a significant amount just for one ton uh, of cement. But even all of that energy is only one third of the emissions. Two thirds is coming from the rock, okay? Now, the other thing I'll, uh, in terms of the typical price uh, for a ton of cement, now this is in, in Euro, but I've converted it to Aussie as well. Uh, it's probably about uh, 90 bucks a ton. Uh, and so when you think about uh, prices on carbon, for example, uh, and the uh, EU uh, emissions trading scheme recently hit sort of as high as a 58 euro per tonne of CO2. And for every tonne of cement you make, you're producing a tonne of CO2. You can see uh, an industry like cement and lime, the, the cost of the CO2 is almost equal to the value of the product they're producing. So this is a significant issue for the cement and lime industries. Uh, now there's obviously uh, various technologies that have been developed to help try and mitigate uh, the CO2 uh, coming from the limestone. Uh, and down sort of the right-hand side of the slide, we've, we've got sort of earlier stage technologies such as amine, ammonia, um, oxyfuel, uh, and increasingly sort of moving up uh, to, uh, sorry, amine is probably the most developed, uh, but just down from there is, is a technology called direct separation, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. But obviously, several technologies being looked at here, given the considerable problem uh, that this industry faces. I'll just uh, go to the next slide. 
So amines, what are amines? Uh, most of you may be aware, but, but I'll cover off just in case. An amine is, is like a chemical solution. Uh, and typical, typically the way an amine system will work is uh, the flue gases that are coming off the cement plant, which may be sort of 20% or so CO2, that needs to be cleaned up so that you can get a pure CO2 stream uh, that you can then uh, do something with, whether that be utilization uh, or ultimately sequestration. Uh, and that amine system operates like a chemical absorbing the CO2, uh, but then that chemical needs to be reboiled again to release that CO2 as a pure stream. Uh, and so it's like having a chemical plant at the back end of your cement plant. Uh, which is all fine and good. Uh, technically, amines have been around for a while uh, and they are being developed to uh, capture CO2 from cement plants now. But the disadvantage is that whole reboiling process, uh, that takes energy. Uh, and so when uh, you expend that energy, you can expend up to 40% of the energy uh, that is ultimately already being produced in it or utilised by a cement plant, and that costs and so in terms of tonnes of CO2 avoided, you can see their estimates of anywhere between 55 to 189 euro per tonne, uh, which uh, at that level is almost three times the cost uh, of producing a single tonne of cement. And so this issue, uh, amines is a solution, but we need to get the cost down if it's gonna be economic for the uh, cement industry. So I'll just move to the next slide. This, uh, so what is uh, direct separation? This is the one just below Amy. Tech readiness level is just sitting above six now. Uh, and I'll talk about the development of, of the technology shortly. Um, but direct separation is, is just a new type of kiln. You can see here, direct separation fits in sort of at the base of that cement pre-calciner tower. Uh, and that's where the reaction is occurring. That's producing the CO2 out of the rock. And so with a different type of kiln that's used there, uh, you can basically directly separate a high purity CO2 stream in an existing cement plant flow sheet. Now, the advantage of doing this is that uh, uh, you don't use any extra energy theoretically to produce that CO2. Heating it up in a direct separation unit uh, will require exactly the same amount of heat as heating it up in a standard kiln. Uh, now, of course, when it comes to implementation, it, that will all depend upon process integration and heat integration to make sure you can use all the heat streams from the cement plant properly. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, it's the lowest theoretical energy cost because it's basically zero. There's no theoretical thermal penalty. The other advantage with direct separation uh, is it's easy to electrify. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about the technology in a little more detail shortly. But of course, you remember I said one third of the uh, CO2 is coming out of burning fuel in the cement plant. Now, if you have a cement plant that's already retrofitted with one of these units uh, that wants to convert to electricity, it is possible. Uh, and so over time, as industry decarbonizes and moves to electrical uh, energy, uh, this type of kiln is ready to go. So what is direct separation? So here's our uh, technology. Uh, it's an Australian homegrown technology, patented, uh, developed here in Australia. Uh, and uh, we're calling it the lilac technology, low emissions intensity lime and cement. Um, and uh, uh, we are Kalix, we're, we're, we're the ones uh, developing and commercialising this technology. Uh, and all we've done is change how a 5,000 year old kiln operates. A, five, you know, a, a kiln is basically you, you, you shove what you want to heat together with how to heat it, like a fuel and you light a match. And it's been done much the same way for sort of 5,000 years. Admittedly, there's been a few process improvements, but the principle is much the same. Uh, what we do is a little bit different. So uh, we separate how you heat from what you heat. Uh, I'll demonstrate that with my uh, little toilet roll here. Uh, so we have a central reactor tube and we heat the outside of this tube and we heat it to about a thousand degrees centigrade. Now this tube is, is a bit bigger than this in a real plant. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll talk about the plant we have in Belgium shortly, but our tube there is 
1.8 metres in diameter and about 36 metres high, so a bit bigger than this. But we heat that tube externally and we don't care how we heat it. It can be, it can be waste fuel, it can be natural gas, it can be renewable electrons, doesn't matter. But we heat it to 1,000 degrees centigrade and whatever we're trying to heat goes down the middle. Uh, and it's got to be fairly small particle size. So imagine holding a lump of flour in your hand. It's that sort of particle size. Uh, and that basically gets dropped down the tube. And imagine dropping a lump of flour and watching it sort of float down to the floor. Uh, so inside our tube, the raw cement meal or ground limestone just basically is introduced in the top and it just floats down through the tube. Now, remember the tube's at 1,000 degrees centigrade. So it's the radiative heat from the red hot walls of this tube that imparts the heat into the particles. And that's what gets that reaction going. Uh, and that separates the CO2 out of the rock to produce your lime, calcium oxide at the bottom. Uh, and the CO2, it's not mixed with any furnace gases. And so what it does is it makes its way back up to the top of the tube and out the top, it's pretty much a pure stream. And so that's the way you can have a different type of kiln to directly separate and capture the CO2 for the cement and lime industries. Now, what's interesting, and I know uh, a lot of speakers have covered this before, but just in terms of the landscape around CO2 capture, it's rapidly changing. Uh, in 2018, uh, uh, the EU ratified what they call the phase four of their emissions trading scheme. And that is effectively where you have a cap uh, on how much CO2 you can emit. Uh, and then anything that you emit above that cap, you have to go on market and buy a CO2 permit. Now that cap is gonna be reducing 2.2% year on year every year from now for the next decade. Uh, and I've written in this slide that as soon as that cap was introduced uh, and ratified by the EU, the price of a ton, emitting a ton of CO2 jumped from five euro to over 25. And as I mentioned recently, uh, it's uh, now hit 58 euro per tonne. Uh, and so there's a lot of drive uh, to uh, certainly uh, Europe in Europe to, to reduce CO2 emissions from, uh, from these types of industries. And then you've seen not only government action, but comp uh, company action like Heidelberg Cement uh, now pledging net zero CO2 by 2050 and a 30% reduction on 1990 levels by 25. Uh, and then in 2020, the EU themselves legislated net zero by 2050. Uh, and then 2021, just this year, uh, the EU voted to introduce a carbon tariff by 2023. So despite the fact we may not have a carbon price here in Australia, uh, suddenly we're seeing carbon as the new tariff barrier. Uh, and for all of our heavy industry, and I'll talk about this shortly, that has ramifications. So regardless of a carbon tax here in Australia, uh, or uh, then uh, we, we, we are going to be subject if we want to maintain an export industry. Just in terms of our technology, where is it at? Uh, apologies for the busy slide, but you will get a copy of this. Um, so we're working uh, with that group of companies uh, and I'll just uh, jump forward in the slide, sorry. There we go. We're working with a group of companies on, on sort of the left-hand side of the slide here. So you can see we're working with Hollywood Cement, Tarmac, Semex, Lust, some of the biggest cement and lime companies in the world. Solvay is in there, one of the biggest chemical companies in the world. Uh, we built our first plant here in Australia in Bacchus Marsh, uh, and that was capable of calciting a different mineral called magnesite, but we had to go to a higher temperature to prove it for cement and lime. Uh, and that's when we, in 1919, we completed construction commissioning of, of our first plant in Belgium. Uh, that plant is capable of about 5% of the throughput of a cement plant. Uh, and so that plant's been operating since 2019 and operating quite successfully. Suffice to say, it was sufficiently successful that Heidelberg Cement and the EU committed further funds. In fact, the EU committed another 16 million euro uh, for our scale-up version. And our scale-up will not have a bigger tube, it'll have four tubes. So our scale-up is simply multiplying the capability of our existing technology uh, to, uh, to take in higher capacities. Uh, and so what we're calling our Lilac 2 demonstration plant uh, has passed its uh, front-end engineering design phase and it's moving through to final investment decision early next year, targeting uh, commissioning late 23. It will be 20% of the throughput of a full-scale cement plant uh, and is already at commercial scale for lime. Uh, and so that's funded and that's underway. And we're targeting, as I say, that to be operational 2024. 
What's really interesting is that uh, our Lilac 3, which might be a full-scale cement plant, is now in planning. So we've been approached by over six cement companies and four lime companies uh, now to start to look at projects that will start from 2024. So at final investment decision point by 2024, what's interesting to us is the development of the technologies not quite sort of linear. Uh, we're having to sort of uh, parallel develop the technology because of the drive from these industries to try and decarbonize as they face penalties such as the uh, EU emissions trading scheme. I've also put capital cost in here, uh, our estimated, our actual and estimated capital cost. Um, and at full scale, uh, the cost of our pre calciner that full tower, is much the same as the cost of an existing uh, pre -cal calciner tower. So for a greenfield cement plant, uh, the capital cost of retrofitting, or, or, sorry, or putting in uh, one of our kilns should be no different to the capital cost, ca capital cost of a best available technology cement plant. Um, so we have uh, just a new type of kiln, um, and that type of kiln uh, is going to be of comparable cost to existing plants. Uh, and also, obviously, we're developing uh, the Lilac 2 scale module as a retrofit option. Just on the next slide, um, one of the things that we often get asked is what to do with the CO2. Uh, there are hubs being developed uh, in both Europe and the US. They're probably the most advanced. US already have a uh, pipeline network for CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, but increasingly, those networks are likely to be used for CO2 sequestration. Uh, and in Europe, uh, hubs are also being developed there, again, to look at uh, CO2 sequestration options. Um, and I know uh, Sophia talked previously about CO2 utilisation. I'd love to have uh, uh, the mineral carbonation technology progress well so that we can utilise the CO2. Uh, e even in the most optimistic scenarios, though, uh, the IEA is talking about uh, a reasonable portion of CO2 being utilised. Uh, but given the amount of CO2 being produced by the industry, 2.2 billion tonnes a year coming out of the rock, uh, we're probably going to have to look at sequestration options. And just on my last slide, um, just a little bit of a summary or snapshot of, of what we see in Australia. Um, you may wonder why an Australian technology went to Europe. Uh, well, when we were developing it, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in Australia to develop it. Um, the ACCUs were there. Uh, but with those, it's very difficult to envisage technical development and um, uh, being a part of an of a ACCU scheme. Uh, and so ACCU tends to be a bit zero technical risk in our view. Um, once a technology is proven, of course, that's a different story. But getting out of that valley of death that uh, we talked about before with the new technology is difficult with that type of scheme. Also I mentioned was the low emissions technology strategy. I think it's good progress, but I think again, as uh, maybe a few other speakers have pointed out, um, it could be looked at as picking winners. Uh, certainly five property areas have been uh, indicated in the first round, um, but uh, uh, for those newer technologies that can make a profit uh, and be profitable and uh, out of uh, out of decarbonisation. Uh, if they've missed out on the, being in those fire priority areas, um, that's uh, not uh, a great thing. Uh, and so we've got to be careful that when we pick roadmaps, that we uh, put roadmaps together, we don't pick winners. Um, and so uh, it's it's that there is a, a, a methodology in there to have new technologies bubble up to the surface, uh, but that could take a little bit of time. So just a watch point on the low emissions technology roadmap. I think the state-based initiatives are quite interesting. Uh, and so New South Wales, Victoria, you know, pledging net zero uh, and the, the Victorian climate change strategy, uh, both of those look promising. Uh, I'd love to wait and see the detail behind the technologies that they may be backing there. Um, but uh, where I think Australia's made great progress uh, is where they've really backed industry and research. Uh, and an example is the Hilt CRC. I know there's several members who'd be on this uh, conference, and including mineral carbon carbonation, of course, as well. Uh, but here you have uh, government funding, industry funding, and research collaborations uh, to really try and move ahead the sorts of technologies that are going to help decarbonise our heavy industry. 
Um, and so I concentrate a lot on cement, but also talk a little bit about lime here because lime is used in steel production. It's used in aluminium production. And all of those are vital uh, industries for Australia moving forward. Uh, and so decarbonising lime, uh, let alone cement, is vital to make sure we have low carbon footprints on uh, any of our export industries to remain competitive uh, as we move forward. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude and, and happy to answer any questions, Mark. Uh, thanks, Phil, and um, thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, uh, one question I have is there's a lot of interest, obviously, in your technology, but a lot of interest overseas. And um, do you see yourself doing more in Australia or do you see there, there being barriers not only in terms of the CO2 infrastructure in Australia and the immaturity of that, that infrastructure, but the policy barriers as well? What, what do you see there in terms of overcoming those barriers in Australia? What needs to happen? Yeah, look, if you'd asked me 12 months ago, I would have had a, a much less uh, rosy outlook on, on doing a project here in Australia than I do today. Mm -hmm. um, certainly policy barriers, um, I think, are uh, being alleviated. As we've seen, we've, we've seen the debate uh, over the, the bill to uh, have a look at the mandate for ARENA and the CFC. Um, I think that debate has, has been very narrow uh, around CCUS, and I think that debate needs to be widened because CCUS is, is not just about fossil fuel, it's, it's, uh, it's about um, industry. Uh, and so I think widening that debate is critical uh, to allow ARENA and the CEFC, uh, which are the key instruments for funding here in Australia under the uh, uh, Low Emissions Technology Roadmap, uh, to to um, invest a bit more widely. Uh, as, uh, as has been said, there's no one winner uh, in this technology race. Australia has to be the winner and, and we have to be technology neutral and we have to widen the mandate of, of, of those sorts of policies. Having said that, uh, as I say, 12 months on, I'm much more encouraged uh, with where we are today in doing the project here in Australia. Uh, the Hilt CRC, for example, has participants uh, such as uh, Adbri, Borrell, uh, Fortescue, Alcoa. Uh, and so seeing industry move here, uh, rather than waiting for technologies off the shelf to be purchased from overseas, uh, has really encouraged, really encouraged me. Uh, and so uh, almost despite some policy um, shortfalls, um, you know, I think the industry here is really uh, grasping uh, the bull by the horn, so to speak, so that we can move forward on developing some technologies and, and some good projects here. Mm. Um, Greenfields feel, sound like they already make good sense if you do a brand new development. Um, what sort of cost curve benefit do you see between, I guess, a renovator's delight in terms of retrofitting with your technology and a and a knockdown rebuild as the, the sensible option for in already installed capacity. Um, is it something that you need to see a, a life of a project for another 20, 30, 40 years, or is it is it something that can be done on, on aged facilities as well? Yeah, look, uh, we're developing the retrofit option because uh, most chemical plants are very capital intensive. Uh, they're built to, to, to go 40, 50, 60 years plus. Uh, and so we're under no illusion that retrofit will be the main business model for developing the technology over the course of the next decade. Hmm. Having said that, uh, the greenfields uh, is, is an area of interest in, in developing countries. Hmm. Uh, and certainly even in countries like China, where you know, they, they produce more cement than anyone else, but they're also going through quite a period of uh, retiring old equipment and building larger and um, uh, better uh, new equipment. Uh, mm. And so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a sort of business model by, by country um, in the developed countries, but in the developing countries, retrofit is, is definitely uh, uh, you know, the way we see the technology rolling out over the course of the next decade or so. Mm. Um, one question from the audience is, uh, what's the best way to, to power the Calyx direct separation process? Uh, the best way uh, depend, depends uh, on whether you've got plenty of renewable electrons or not. Mm. Uh, because if you do, um, you can power with renewable electrons during the middle of the day when there's, there's lots of sunshine and lots of, of wind and, and maybe there's not a lot of draw on the network. 
Yeah. Uh, and then at night, you can switch across to uh, whatever you like. You can burn uh, waste fuels, uh, you can burn biomass, mm -hmm. uh, you can burn traditional uh, fossil fuels. Um, and so uh, at the moment, that load balancing is actually uh, quite an interesting value in and of itself because uh, big loads that help balance the grid uh, are important and of value. Um, and so uh, in, in our view, there, there's, there's no best way. We're, we're, we're energy ambivalent, if you like, um, but there is value in looking lo at load balancing. Um, and one final one, Phil, before we leave you, is um, uh, Australian and global companies are focusing very much on ESG. Uh, what role can your technologies play in those ESG policies, I guess, and and maybe even a little bit around the, the um, say, the border adjustment taxes and things like that? How, how do you see your, your technology playing a role around that? Yeah, I, I guess with, with ESG uh, investment, so to speak, it's really quite interesting because... Mm. Um, again, compared to even just a year ago, the amount of money uh, that's moving into ESG investments uh, and also driving, you know, the, the institutional um, uh, demands, if you like, as shareholders of big companies um, is really uh, forcing uh, big companies to move in a direction that is about decarbonisation as well as sustainability and governance, of course, as well. Um, and so um, we're as a company <laughs> developing a technology that, that is about decarbonising, say, cement and lime, mm. we're in a very good space uh, with respect to um, ESG investment. Um, the other thing uh, is uh, with respect to, as I mentioned before, uh, Australia's position as an exporter of goods, uh, and I think it's been mentioned before, it's not just cement and lime per se, and uh, it's the way lime then lays across uh, some of our key export industries, such as aluminium. I think it, Europe is one of the largest um, markets for us for our aluminium industry. Um, and we're also trying to develop, say, local lithium industries here as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, lithium produced for batteries in the world comes from Australia, from, from an ore called spodumene. Um, but we are going to be up against it if we cannot produce that lithium ore uh, in a low carbon way. Uh, mm. And so with respect to our technology, uh, we, we've recently uh, signed an MOU with Pilgrim Minerals uh, mm. to look at onshoring uh, uh, lithium salt production. So not just exporting rocks, but uh, mm. processing the rocks here to make a lithium salt and doing it in a way, because our calciner can, can use renewable energy, uh, doing it in a way that can produce mm. a low carbon footprint salt, mm. uh, lithium salt for lithium ion batteries. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers the question mark about, about how no, our technology can can, yeah. can sit in this space. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Phil. I think um, yeah, we we've really enjoyed your presentation today, and um, thank you for taking the time to to speak to us all, um, and share what's going on at um, Calix. And um, we look forward to uh, hearing more and hearing about some Australian projects coming online uh, soon enough as well. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Mark. And thanks everyone for your attention.